Happy Easter. Happy Easter. We heard in our gospel passage today about Easter exactly one week ago, and we also heard about today, one week after Easter. The resurrection accounts two of them that we hear today in our gospel passage, often referred to as the story of the doubting Thomas, tells two stories of Easter. The first night of the resurrection, Easter Sunday night, and then one week later. Here we are one week later after Easter Sunday. And of course, we refer to this Sunday as Divine Mercy Sunday. In 1937, our Lord Jesus Christ appeared to a nun in Poland, St. Faustina, and this image that you see here was painted in exact detail from the description of St. Faustina that she gave to us. This is known as the image of divine mercy. This image is our Lord appearing in the upper room on Easter night. This is our Lord walking through the locked doors. I'd like to talk about why this image is absolutely so important on what happened that night. So first of all, let's talk about who was in the room. Who was in the room on that first Easter night? There were 12 apostles. One of them had committed suicide at this point, which makes 11. Thomas is not there. There are 10 men in that room. Out of those 10, only one of them, only one of them was not a coward. Only one of them did not run away from our Lord at his hour of greatest need. Only one of them did not desert our Lord. There were 10 men in that room, and John, the beloved disciple, is the only one who did not run away. At the crucifixion scene, who is the only one present? John, the beloved disciple. When Jesus is laid in the tomb, and we have the 13th and 14th station, who is the only apostle present? John, the beloved disciple. So let me ask you a question, and I'll particularly ask the women. Women, if you were dying, if you had been flogged, betrayed, and beaten, and your husband deserted you, how would you feel? Gentlemen, if you had abandoned, deserted, and betrayed your wife at her hour of greatest need, other people had buried her, and then you heard that she had come back to life, would you be scared? <laughs> I think the fact that these men are behind locked doors is not just because they are afraid of the Jews. They have abandoned Jesus. They deserted him. They left him. And now they hear that he is alive. If we follow the account of what has taken place, three people have seen Jesus alive after the resurrection. Remember, the women go to the tomb early in the morning, but all the women do not see Jesus, only one, and that is Mary Magdalene. Then on Easter evening... Two of the disciples are on the road to Emmaus walking and Jesus appears to them. These three people are not the apostles. They are not of the twelve. But all three of them go and tell the apostles that they have seen Jesus alive. And nine of them deserted Jesus. In all four gospel accounts, there's also something very, very clear that all four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, explicitly reference. And that is what is found in the tomb. What is found in the tomb in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account of the gospel? Burial cloths. 
And if you do not think that Mary Magdalene, the women, and even Peter and John who ran to the tomb on Easter Sunday morning but did not see him, would not have taken these cloths and brought them to the upper room, you are mistaken. So let's talk about what these cloths are. I need three of my servers to help me out. You guys can stand across the top here. Oh, look, I'm going to go to the tomb. This is a 14 by three and a half foot piece of cloth. Can you two girls step right over here? I'm going to show you how it, move up anyway. I'm going to show you how it works. Hey, play dead. <laughs> that was pretty good. The, ways that Je- the, the, the way that the Jews would bury people at the time of Jesus is they would take a really, really long piece of cloth They would lay it under the person's body. You're dead. Stop moving. (laughs) Then they would take the cloth and lay it over him. This is why the cloth is 14 feet long. One cloth. They were different than the Egyptians who mummified and would wrap the individual. They would take one cloth and lay it under the body, put the body down, put the cloth on top. You can stand up. Thank you very much. Which is why we are going to see what we are going to see. Please stand here in the center, and please do not get your hair burnt. Thank you. And there we go. If you can hold that up a little bit. This is the Shroud of Turin, which is the burial cloth of Jesus. No scientist. It is the most studied artifact. It is the most studied artifact by science, which has been unable to prove but more importantly, has been unable to disprove that this is the burial cloth of Jesus. Now, what you're looking at, what your eyes most likely are looking at right now is these triangular shapes and the really, really dark brown coloring. So I'm going to quickly explain what those are. I'm going to grab the cloth right here. The Shroud of Turin, which is the burial cloth of Jesus, was folded very nicely like this. Right where you can see the burn marks are. It was then folded like this. And then folded like this. Until the year 1532, this cloth was folded like this and kept in a silver lined box. In 1532 there was a fire in the convent of the religious sisters where this image was stored. The silver-lined box had a glass opening where you could clearly see what? The face of Jesus. When the fire hit the convent, all of the edges began to burn. The very pious and devout religious sisters then made patches to patch the holes and the marks on the cloth. So when you look at the Shroud of Turin, please try to not look at the dark brown marks because those were not there until 1532, and this cloth actually predates the death of Jesus because it was woven by hand prior to his burial. If we look at the 14th station, when Jesus is laid in the tomb, they had to bury Jesus very quickly because he died at 3 o'clock and sundown was around 5.30 or 6, and all Jewish people had to stop all work. So they buried his body very quickly. The question is, who is the man that we see in this cloth? We clearly see that this is the head. So here's the front of the cloth that was laid over him. Here is the back of the cloth. So this is his back. That's the back of his head. Here is his buttocks, the back of his legs, the bottom of his feet. The cloth laying on him, you see his face, You see his torso, you see his two hands crossed like this, you then see his quadriceps, and you see the top part of his shins. If we ask, who is this man? Well, the better question to ask is, what happened to this man? So we'll take it in the order of what happened to our Lord. The first, of course, is this man has clearly been flogged. 
If you look upon his body, you'll see hash marks going in angular directions. The, ways that, the way that Romans flogged their victims is that they would tie a victim to a four-foot pole. Then there were two soldiers that were assigned to the detail. One would stand on this side, and the other would stand on this side. And they would alternatively take times, take turns, flogging the victim. This is clearly why the flog marks on Jesus' body, on the front and the back, because Romans did not just scourge on the back, he was flogged on both sides of his body completely naked. This is why the, the marks are on a hash mark pattern going across his entire body. You'll then notice upon his head that there are puncture wounds with blood that is dripping down. This is, of course, from the crowning of thorns that took place as part of his mockery for claiming to be the king of the Jews. You see those same blood marks on the back of his head. What you'll notice, however, is that this is not the traditional crown that we think of, which was solely a line that went around his head. The Shroud of Turin actually shows the fact that it actually was more like a bucket or a helmet that went over the entire head and not just a small little wreath. We then notice the fact that this man has been crucified. Most obviously, we see this in his hands that are laid like this. We see it in the exit wounds on the feet here and also on the bottom of the feet there. Interesting is this. Some people will try to say that the Shroud of Turin is a forgery. I want you right now, if you're wearing a crucifix, to look at the crucifix on your necklace. I want you to look at the sacred artwork that we have here in the church of Jesus being crucified here in the Stations of the Cross and here behind the altar. Where are the nail marks on the crucifix that you're wearing and in 99% of all Christian art? In the hands. Which is not actually historically accurate. Because if you crucified a man by putting a nail through his hand, it would rip out. However, if you do not know this, it was illegal to depict crucifixion. The Romans, after the fall of the Roman Empire, were so embarrassed that this is how they tortured human beings, it was made illegal to depict crucifixion. It was also a way to persecute the Christians. So what happened is generations of individuals had no idea what crucifixion looked like. So when early Christians began glorifying in the cross and began making crucifix crucifixion images, they put the nails into the hands. Actually, a biblical reference, they have pierced my hands and my feet from the book of Isaiah. However, we now know from archaeology, from digging up the remains of crucified victims, that they were crucified in the wrist. But also, if you look at the here, at the Shroud of Turin, where was Jesus crucified? In the wrist. Also, thus proving the fact that it can't be a forgery because no one depicted the nail, wound, the, the, the nail wounds in the wrist. We'll also then notice that there is a pierce in his side right here. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> this is him being pierced in the side. This is the blood flowing down his side. And you can actually then see it actually pooling around the small of his back as it coagulated. Now the most amazing thing about this shroud is not the fact that it has blood marks on it. It's not the fact that there is dirt. It's not the fact that there are over 27 flowers that have been found through their pollen on this plant that are only native to Jerusalem. What is most peculiar about this image and if you two here can hold this is the fact if you look at this image you can actually see a man. I could crucify someone right now. I could put blood on them. I could wrap them up in a sheet but I would not get this image. I would just get blood on a cloth. But the reality is, is if you look at this cloth, you actually see the image of a man. And that is the miracle that is unexplainable. To, uh, to explain the image that you see on this cloth, we have to talk about something called photography, which 
we don't really know about anymore. Anybody who is young in this church has no idea what photography is. If we're talking about pixels, we're no longer talking about photography. So boys and girls, there used to be this thing called photography, where you had a camera, and you would go to a drugstore and you would buy a canister of film. You would then take that canister of film, which might have 12 or 24 or 36, or if you're really wealthy, 48 pictures on the film. You would then take the roll of film and you would stretch it out over the back of your camera really, really quick, closing the door because fear that what would happen? Because the film was light sensitive. Now, this is the amazing thing, boys and girls. Photography was not invented until 1823. And we're going to talk about what would then would happen is that you would then take your film to the drugstore. Sometimes you would take a picture and you would forget that you took the picture because you wouldn't have your film sometimes developed for like a month later. And you'd be like, oh, look at that. I forgot I even took a picture of that. When they gave you your 12, your 24, your 36 pictures, they then would also give you a bunch of little brown strips. And what were those called? Negatives. So this is a negative. This is a negative. And when you would then shine light through the negative, you would get a picture. So here's a picture, and here's a negative. Here's a picture, and here's a negative. You'll notice that everything that is black is white, and everything that is white is black. What is the Shroud of Turin, my brothers and sisters? The Shroud of Turin is actually a negative from the burst of light from Jesus' resurrection. Please lift that above your head. The Shroud of Turin is a negative film of the resurrection of Jesus from the burst of cloth, the burst of light that took place at the moment of Jesus' resurrection. Thus proving the resurrection, and thus having to, once again, if this is a forgery, the person would also have to, in their mind, come up with the idea of photography prior to its invention of photography in 1832. What is the Shroud of Turin? The Shroud of Turin is a negative created by God himself to reveal who Jesus is. This is the burial cloth of Jesus, and I will tell you, go back to that night in the room. That night in the upper room, my brothers and sisters, I believe that there are apostles who were terrified. When I was a young child, I did really, really bad things. I had a brother. We would fight. We would argue. I would sometimes lie. I would sometimes steal. And my mother, because she was a very good mother, when she was taking care of my older brother and I, and I would get in trouble, she would say the thing that all good mothers should say. Jonathan, go to your room and wait until your dad comes home. And I would go to my room and I would be terrified. Now, this is before technology, and my mother would never have ever, ever, ever called my dad at the office and disrupted his work. There was no texting. So my dad would not hear about what I had done until I had come home. I would hear my dad pull into the driveway. I would hear my mom and dad talking. I could then hear my dad walking up the steps. I could then hear my dad put his hand on the door handle, and then I would start crying. Why? Because what happens when you do something wrong? Punishment, retaliation. What do you think those 12 apostles thought would happen when Jesus came back and they had seen that he was alive? And this is the first time, hold this up again. This is the first time that the 12 apostles because they, abandoned, they didn't see him get flogged. They didn't see a crown of thorns in his head. They didn't see him crucified, but they saw this. Can you guys take a step here to this way? Move this way. But then my brothers and sisters, hold that up above your head. But then who comes through the door? Jesus does. And what are the first words of our God? Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. He doesn't come with a fist. He comes with a feast. A feast of mercy. He doesn't come with a fist. He comes with a feast. 
a feast of mercy. My brothers and sisters, the God that we profess is a God of mercy and a God of love. The God that we profess is a God of mercy and a God of love, and our world doesn't know this. And our, our world clearly is not living what Jesus then said to the apostles, because he said to the apostles, as the Father sent me, so now I send you. How did the Father send Jesus to be mercy, to forgive, to say, peace be with you? As the Father sent me, so now I send you. How are we supposed to love each other? Just the way, the same way that he did. When we are betrayed, when we are denied, when we are treated wrongly, how are we called to love our brother? Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. The love and the mercy of Jesus is radical, and what happened in that upper room is beyond our imagining. This painting, which was painted by a Polish artist in Krakow, Poland, matches up anatomically perfectly to the Shroud of Turin. By chance? I don't think so. Do we understand the mercy of God? Do we understand the God that we celebrate today? And do we understand the mercy that he has for you and for me? My brothers and sisters, we celebrate today a God who does not have a fist, but a God who puts up his hand in blessing and says, peace be with you. When we cast our eyes in the image of mercy, when we cast our eyes in the bursting rays of red and white of baptism in the Eucharist, we are invited to then go and live that mercy. So let's pray for that grace. Let's pray for conversion. Let's pray for the ability to be apostles of mercy. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you.